Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer, and today I'm going to be playing, what is it, part 5 of my, I should know that, right? Part 1, we uh, just failed to take Seminary Ridge, we took Oak Ridge, part 2, we took Seminary Ridge, and uh, we also took Culp's Hill, part 3, we took Cemetery Hill, and part 4, which was our last episode, we took Little Round Top, although we failed to take the Baltimore Pike. It was the first battle early in the day on July 2nd. Basically, taking the Baltimore Pike would have ensured the destruction of the Union Army. It would have cut off their line of retreat toward Washington, uh, and it also would have broken their left flank by taking Little Round Top. We did succeed in taking Little Round Top, but we did not take the Baltimore Pike. Now we are on to the fifth battle. Uh, the scenario is called Mad Plan to Repel the Confederates from Seminary Ridge. Uh, so it sounds almost like the Union's kind of trying to march around our army's flank and hit us in the flank, but I honestly don't know because the game is in early access right now and we have no write-up. Uh, but we do have a scenario. So we start with 19,000 troops, so we start with a slight numerical advantage, a huge artillery advantage, uh, but the Union's going to have 10,000 reinforcements arriving, so they'll outnumber us pretty substantially in what is looking to be a very large battle. Um, so I guess we'll just have to go ahead and, and jump into the fight here and kind of uh, see what's going on here, because this is obviously not a historical scenario. It's uh, one of those alternative scenarios based on our huge successes. We had an epic victory two battles ago, and last battle was a minor victory, so the Union's being steadily pushed back and on the verge of destruction. I would imagine this is one of those crazy attempts to salvage victory from the jaws of defeat. Uh, it looks like it's about 3.45 p.m., so our, our first fight on July 2nd took place around 7 a.m., after the failure there, the Union's launched this attack now around 3 a.m., so there's probably some time for them to move, maneuver and try and get around us. But I guess we'll see. Uh, again, a mad plan by the Union to try and repel the Confederates from Seminary Ridge. That's in our rear. We're all the way to the east in Cemetery Ridge, but now they're going around our army. So I guess we'll see what happens. Okay, so you can see our troops there on Seminary Ridge. This is odd because we did take Cemetery Ridge, so somehow the Union has Cemetery Ridge and Cemetery Hill back. I'm not sure that makes a whole lot of sense. How did we... Yeah, and the only victory... So this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Apparently somehow we lost Cemetery Ridge, and now the enemy is going to try and take Cemetery Ridge from us. I... I that one's a little bit strange. But I guess we don't have... I mean, we just need to move our troops in. I guess there's no there's no real point in uh, discussing the absurdity of what's happened. I don't know if it was a poor planning or if there's... You know, the paragraph might give some kind of explanation on, on why this is happening. Our troops are really spread out. Why is our artillery way the no far north on here? It's almost like we're back on the evening of July 1st with our current positions. But uh, it is what it is. We just got to kind of deal with it. Now we got troops north. I don't want to just take Cemetery Hill. I don't know if we're supposed to attack. It says it's a mad federal plan. Bring some of these guys down here. I don't know what's going on. They retook Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and Cemetery Hill without a scenario. Interesting. They've obviously got artillery down here, so maybe they're trying to march around our army. I'm not sure. I guess I've got Daniel's Brigade out here. All these troops are really spread out. I keep hearing sporadic musketry, but I don't know where. Yep, see, it looks like a Union flanking attempt. So we're going to move Daniel down here. We're going to pull Wilcox's brigade. A large percentage of our force seem to be in an area that we don't need them. So I'm going to bring these reinforcements from the 2nd Corps under General Early. I would look where I'm ordering, ordering these troops, but I really don't think... It matters, as far as I can tell. We're going to move this artillery up here on this ridge. Should have a clear line of sight at the enemy and some good uh, good angles to shoot at them. Oh boy. Daniel's about to be outnumbered heavily here. One brigade against a ton. Ah, uh, crap. I need 
need to buy time. Daniel, you're gonna have to be our sacrificial lamb. Sorry. Gonna pull some artillery out. Infantry's already pulling out. You know what? I'm just gonna pull all of you out from this side of the map because frankly there's no victory points for Culp's Hill. Um, you know, and I don't see much point. If this was a uh, tactical, uh, or yeah, if I was, if I had concerns that troops stay where they are, then I wouldn't be doing this. But uh, this battle kind of confuses me as it's, it, it doesn't make sense given what's come from b before. But again, this is early access and the scenario is obviously not done yet either, so maybe there's a better explanation of what's going on. Either way, I'm pulling early out and shifting them to my other flank. This is just going to be kind of a mess of soldiers everywhere. Pull out these batteries of artillery as well. Get these guys out of here. It's going to be one busy roadway. So Daniel's been driven back. I'm sure the Federals are going to try and swing around us. Maybe around McPherson's Ridge. That would kind of be the logical thing to assume. So we'll get some... Some infantry over there. Where's uh, our other corps commander? We've got to have two on the field with this many troops. Yep, third corps, General Hill. Hill's course lost so many men. He lost 7,900 men. He was 11,000 left. Nearly 50% casualties. I don't know if the Yankees are going to attack across the Seminary Ridge. I hope they don't. As I'm shifting basically all my troops away from there. Bring Archer in. At the very least, they'd be attacking over open ground. I'm going to detail Ramasar here, rather than everything to my left. When the reinforcements do arrive, they're going to heavily outnumber us. But I'm not sure where they're going to attack. We're, we're kind of spread out, though. And a lot of these troops on this flank are, are heavily fought out. You get Perrin with over 500 casualties. That's about a third of his men. Thomas has about a quarter of his men as casualties. Wright's in decent shape, only about 10%. Davis has lost 1,400 men. He has 800 left. That's over 50%. Daniel there has lost over a third. Wilcox here has lost about a quarter. Pettigrew's lost over half. So these units that they're going to be attacking are very, very fought out. Very tired. Probably not going to be able to put up as much resistance as we would hope. But maybe they'll delay and not do anything, because as of right now... I don't... Do I lose if I don't retake Seminary Ridge? Because that's pretty BS. If that's the case. Considering I never lost it to them in the first place and they just magically retook it. That's really kind of... I'm a little bit sour about that. But I can't attack this. They just have too many men at this point. I mean, are we going to go into history now? I mean, I just won a battle where I took Little Round Top. Now, all of a sudden, my left flank is caved in. Little Round Top's right down here. Ugh. Anyway. I don't know if these guys are shooting at all, or if their line of sight's blocked, or what. The 5th Corps did engage in that last battle to some extent. I know we fought with, uh, Weed's Brigade. Well, we put Graham up here on this part of the ridge. Should give him some high ground. A lot of... Gettysburg was difficult in that a lot of the terrain is suitable for cavalry, and then there's a lot that isn't at all. So we're going to run these guys up into range of the artillery. We'll go ahead and halt them so they can fire into the artillery. If Smith's going to try and come, then we're going to come to his aid. I 
That might not be wise. Hopefully the enemy artillery pulls out of range. Whoa, are we charging? No. Good. I wonder if this is... I doubt it's... It's not... It's not open. Come on, guys. I don't know. I just feel like kind of sitting here and doing nothing for this battle. I don't want to attack and lose more men. I'm already outnumbered by about 10,000 men in this fight. I can't afford reckless attacks. At this point in time, my army's too fought out. Longstreet would be pissed. Just a couple of lone regiments kind of... Kind of engaging each other. A little bit of artillery dueling. It seems like their men got better artillery positions than ours, but... Maybe that's just my own imagination here. Pulled out early. I should, probably should have pulled early himself out if we're going to pull all his troops out. So you can see here we've refused our flank along this part of Seminary Ridge into a pretty strong line. The AI is being cautious and not attacking us. Uh, if you haven't seen the previous videos, we selected a cunning AI, which makes them very cautious and unwilling to attack unless they know they've got an advantage. But they'll wait for you. They'll, leave, they'll lay ambushes. And um, they also are very determined when they do attack. So they're kind of like General Longstreet. They're, they're slow to act. They don't charge forward willy-nilly. But when they do attack, they attack with a lot of force and a lot of heat. Um, nearly beat me in the last battle. It's on the hardest difficulty for a cautious AI. Uh, I think one excellent feature about this game is it does have a modular AI. So you've got nine different groups of AI kind of strategies or tactics to choose from. You've got three on each level, so kind of three easy, three medium, three hard. And then you've also got um, kind of different types. So there's the three easy, three uh, medium, and three hard. And of that, there's the cautious, the kind of middle of the road, and then the super aggressive AI that you can choose from. So, you know, you can choose an easy, super aggressive, which will just make boneheaded decisions and probably attack piecemeal, and you'll pick them apart. Or you can choose the aggressive AI that's very, very difficult, in which case, you know, it might be like facing General General uh, Jackson. Uh, or you can go with kind of a balanced approach uh, for the AI or, you know, a more difficult, uh, or, or not more difficult, but a more cunning approach. Where in one case, they might just be totally passive and let you march around their flank if you're playing easy. But if you're playing on cunning, then they might lay uh, coordinated and smart ambushes for you or wait to attack until they know they can just completely overwhelm you. So uh, that's kind of the direction that the AI goes in this game. It's kind of a unique little twist. It's very reminiscent of uh, Sid Meier's Gettysburg. You can see a lot of Sid Meier's Gettysburg's influence, I believe, in this series. I don't know if Darth, the developer of the game, played Sid Meier's. Uh, I know he played Total War because he made a bunch of really popular and famous mods for it. Um, but the Sid Meier's Gettysburg game, was it 1998 that it came out? Still kind of, it's a huge influencer on the, on the market and the industry. And uh, it seems to be the, that way with every game that Sid Meier develops. Losing pretty heavily uh, with this regiment against this artillery battery, but the Union's already really short on artillery, so, you know, the more, the more hurt I can lay on them, the better. Just move these brigades forward to kind of engage, actually do something here. Maybe I can inflict some losses. Again, I don't want to be super aggressive and get my men all chewed to pieces. But I don't have any problem engaging in, in a bit of a firefight here. Especially when I've got some reserves back here. A doesn't seem to be doing anything else. They seem to be holding their historical July 2nd positions here on, on Cemetery Hill. Historical July 2nd positions, not historical at all based on, or not accurate based at all on what's what's transpired already. So Davis here is losing some more men. We'll get Hill down. Maybe he can rally him before his men waver. We're at 19% morale. So you can see that morale jumped up with the arrival of Hill. So his men will stand and fight for a little bit longer than they otherwise would have. But they're retreating into the enemy lines. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Retreat paths. What? 
I would think the battle would be just about over. Uh, the green line's up. Normally at this point in time it kind of either ends the battle or says battle delayed. That's up here. Um, you kind of start counting down with the red. It does say battle delayed. I don't know if that's because we haven't taken our objective yet here. But it would seem kind of pointless to launch yet another assault on the enemy. I don't know why Davis is... Are you trying to surrender, Davis? Why are you running right at the bad guys? You know what? We're going to... We're going to hold lane right there. Because it looks like by lane being where he is, all these batteries of artillery have a clear lane of fire so they can fire into these advancing uh, Union troops on their flank. So line of sight does appear to matter for, uh, for artillery, which is a good thing. So hopefully we can kind of devastate them. Give them something to think about. We've got a lot of men down there. So they are launching an attack of some sorts. The sound effects, and I think I said this in one of my earlier videos, but the sound effects in this game, boy do they remind me of um, the movie The Patriot. The, the volley and the crack of the musket just sounds just like that movie. So uh, Hayes' regiment is outnumbered about a 3 to 1 against Fisher here. But he does have a lot of close-range artillery support kind of firing into this Union force. They don't seem to be doing much in the way of casualties, though. Uh, that is one thing the Confederacy really struggled with uh, during the Civil War, is their artillery uh, tended to be pretty low quality, not in terms necessarily of the actual men firing the guns, but the quality of the shells that they were firing. Often the fuses were faulty, and uh, the shells would, would sail long, uh, or they would, they would not detonate at all. And the way a Civil War artillery shell works is, is basically think of a a hollow metal cannonball that's filled with, you know, dozens of uh, lead balls or pieces of shrapnel, and there's an explosive charge in the middle, so that when that sh when that uh, explosive charge detonates, it sends these little, almost like musket balls, raining down on soldiers nearby. You know, generally the idea is you want to fire it over the heads of your enemy, explode it over top of them, and have the shrapnel rain down into them. Now. Uh, that obviously underscores the importance of having reliable fuses. You know, if you're a thousand yards out and you set your fuse to explode at three seconds because you know how quickly an artillery shell uh, travels uh, coming out of the cannon, you can say, okay, well, it'll take three seconds to travel a thousand yards, so we want it to explode at that point. So let's set the fuse for a thousand yards. And it's this little paper fuse, basically, uh, that, you, that you light and then that uh, that kind of counts down. It's almost like a fuse on a, on a piece of dynamite. Now, the way that that works is the explosion of the cannon lights the fuse uh, on fire, and then, you know, that way you don't have someone manually lighting the fuse, rolling it down the cannonball, and by the time it gets in there, you know, you worry about it blowing up on you. So that gives it that consistency element. Um, so again, you've got a fuse that gets lit when the cannon goes off, and then uh, when the fuse reaches the bottom, it causes the explosives in the middle of the shell to explode, causes the shrapnel to rain down on your enemy, uh, so you do want to explode over their heads, and uh, that's the way artillery works. Now the Confederacy, unfortunately for them, didn't have reliable manufacturing for their um, their shells. So they had a lot of very poor quality uh, artillery shells, which meant that often the Confederacy overshot their targets. They might set it for three seconds and the shell might explode after four or not at all. Maybe the fuse uh, didn't even catch fire when the cannon exploded. So you saw a lot of situations where Confederate artillery continually overshot uh, the Yankees um, because of unreliable fuses, whereas the Union had very good quality fuses, so they were much more reliable. Again, it's, it's a lot of guesswork and, um, and it's, it's certainly not easy to fire artillery at long range. That's why you see things with uh, more accurate fusing and, and longer range weapons and more rapid firing. You see artillery really change in scope uh, with the, their percussion cap and percussion shells. and You see kind of a, a change in the effectiveness of artillery. During the Civil War, the most effective artillery would have actually been canister fire, which was the when the enemy oh, closed in to within about 200 yards, you would load, load a shell, which is essentially just a can with a ton of little balls in it that would come out the second the shell was fired. So 
Um, that would be like a shotgun shell almost. So when it fires, it sprays these out in a pattern. Now they disperse very quickly, so the range at which you could fire that and be effective is much l less than what you could fire an artillery shell at. But you don't have to worry about a fuse going off at the right time, and it basically just throws out this blanket of shells and little, little balls in front of your cannon, which makes charging the cannon incredibly dangerous. And uh, when units got really close, I think about 50 or 60 yards, maybe 40 yards away, they'd put a second shell in there, so they'd fire two shells at once. That was called double canister. So that was uh, definitely the most deadly and effective form of artillery during the Civil War, basically using cannons like big shotguns. Um, now, the shells were the more common uh, because you could fire those at much greater ranges. And uh, also, used, uh, also used during the Civil War was a relic of previous artillery, which was solid shot. Solid shot was exactly as it sounds. There's no explosive in the middle of the shell. It doesn't shoot out shrapnel. You don't want to shoot the shell over your opponent. You just want to shoot it straight into their line. It's a solid uh, lead ball. And uh, that would that could be used at long range. Often that would be fired down the flank of an enemy. If, if your enemy showed you their side, you'd fire that because that could go right through their line. And that solid ball would just tear through multiple people uh, until eventually it spent all its energy. So that would be an ideal weapon to be used at extremely long range, maybe for counter battery fire where shrapnel wounds were less important, but maybe physically knocking out the cannon was. Or again, if you could fire down the line, you could kind of knock men out like bowling pins. But uh, that's enough of that artillery discussion here. As you can see, we lost, again, almost three times the Union troops' uh, casualties. We held Cemetery Ridge, but uh, they held Cemetery Ridge. We held Seminary Ridge, sorry. The battle was a draw. Um... So I'm not sure where that leads us. Okay, so we can either attack the Union Center, uh, which I believe is would be Pickett's Charge. I think we're going to be going into the third day. We can attack the Union Left, which would be attacking Culp's Hill, or we can attack the Union Right, which would be kind of the old, or sorry, the Union Right would be Culp's Hill. Attacking the Union Left would be attacking um, Little Round Top, and attacking the Center would be Pickett's Charge. All on July 3rd, I would imagine. So. I will say this is a little bit disappointing to me, the, the, the route that this went. We won a minor victory, and we had we won a crushing victory. We took Culp's Hill, we took Cemetery Hill, we took Seminary Ridge. We drove the Union all the way out of their, their historical positions. The next battle was fought south of the Union positions. We took Little Round Top, but we didn't take the Baltimore Pike. And somehow, because we won that victory, we lost all of the gains we had before. We lost Cemetery Ridge, we lost Cemetery Hill, we lost Culp's Hill... And now in this last battle, the Union launched a desperate attack against our flank at Semin Seminary Ridge. And now, somehow, despite all this huge success, the Union have Little Round Top back in their control. They have Culp's Hill back in their control. They've got Cemetery Ridge and Cemetery Hill back in their control. i got to say, that's pretty disappointing to me. I really love this game. It's been a lot of fun playing it so far, but that just doesn't make any sense that you'd reverse yourself after all of that just to, to back where you were. Uh, this seems really... Really disappointing. I mean, one of the real cool aspects of this game is in certain circumstances you can make choices like this. And in another scenario where we hadn't had as much success, this would be awesome to be able to choose what we want to do on the third day's battle. But it's really, really disappointing to me personally having all the success, and now we don't... Unless they just haven't finished making all the hypothetical scenarios. I know they've got 30 scenarios, that's a lot. But it seems a little bit wrong for you to be thrown out of your positions that you had taken when you had had huge successes on July 1st and early July 2nd. All of a sudden that all gets negated uh, because uh, we don't have a scenario for that? <sighs> that's a little bit disappointing, like I said. Um, anyway, part... Six of the series is going to look at whether I decide to do the historical Pickett's Charge, attack the Union left or right, uh, and continue the fight on. We must be near the end of the battle at this point. Um, but uh, that was that was it. The Union failed to take Cemetery Ridge. I didn't really make an effort to retake Cemetery Hill or Ridge or whatever that was. Anyway, uh, I appreciate you tuning in. This is the Historical Gamer saying thank you. And if you like this, definitely let me know. Leave a comment. Until next time, though, this is the Historical Gamer signing out.